find one. My heart beeps, beeps yeah. like, you know, I get really excited and happy. Of this is my reward. is you are kind of at the basis of gypsy jazz like making it a worldwide thing you yes. have a very important role there could you explain or tell me a little bit about that first how what happened how did you yeah. start doing um, that and why i'm flattered that someone still remembers because this was so long ago you know in the when 70s was it? in the 70s when uh, when we started to play in norway uh, hot club de norvege mm -hmm. we looked everywhere to find um, if there were some, somebody else out there. And we met uh, Rafael Faiz mm -hmm. and Fabi. Yeah. And, uh, playing in Vasel at that time. Yeah. And there was Ian Krugshank in London, uh, Schnuckenack, Reinhardt, and... Uh, you met Schnuckenack, Reinhardt? No, I didn't meet him, but uh, he was, he still was alive. there. He was, <laughs> yes, and he was there. So, and the Piotos, of I'm course. I'm singing his songs now. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and at that time, the the gypsy jazz, it was, it didn't exist. It was st uh, still someone remembering Django. The yeah. Matteo Ferré, he was still yeah. in Paris, but nobody knew it about him because the music had uh, had been forgotten practically. It was very few people. So Rafael Faiz, Fabi, and you know, one hand, five people really? to begin with. And, uh, I didn't know that. I thought the legend was kind of lived on after his death. In the, in the gypsy world, mm -hmm. but in the gypsy world, it was at that time separated mm -hmm. from the Gaji. So when, when I started to go to Paris, it was not easy. Uh, it, it happened later that uh, I got access and was uh, accepted among the gypsies. But slowly, in the beginning of the 80s, uh, in 1980, I started the Django Festival in Norway, mm -hmm. so which is 37 years now. So just imagine how old I must be. Uh, then my own quartet, we had um, we had uh, recorded one album, one LP, mm -hmm. and we wanted to record the next one. Mm -hmm. But at that time. All the record companies, there were just a very few, mm -hmm. few uh, big record companies. And if you wanted to have a record deal, you would have to wait for years, which was uh, just wow. a waste of time. Yeah. But at the same time, in, uh, in London, the mm -hmm. punk musicians had started to, uh, to, to say, let's just forget about the established uh, record companies, we'll do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Frank Zappa did the same. Mm -hmm. He said, to uh, Warner Brothers and wanted to release his own music. So I did the same. In 1982 I started Hot Club Records mm -hmm. in order to release our second LP. So it was very difficult and I did all the mistakes you can imagine. So I learned a lot. Yes. You know, you learn by mistakes. I, I know. <laughs> so shortly after, uh, some other groups, to begin with from Norway, asked me, oh, you did it yourself. Can you do it for us as well? Sure, why not? So, I, um, so two things happened. Already from 1982, I started with a continuous production in the studio. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of experience. I worked with many, many different types of jazz. Mm -hmm. And uh, each time I met, uh, you know, in, in the studio, you get very close to the artists. And when you meet someone like uh, Stephen Grappelli later or Chet Baker or Warren Marsh um, and can study them really close and listen for, for a week. It's, uh, it's like Academy of Music which, and that became my Academy of Music. So since then I've produced in average one record every month. So it's uh, four, uh, 500 by now. <laughs> Most of my life. What an 
I've spent uh, role, working with jazz records. Yeah. So, but that's behind the scenes. You know? yeah. That's uh, I learned a lot from it, and uh, I love it. I wish it was still a business, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, it's more like uh, it's an artistic endeavor. Yeah, you have to do it. Yeah, and uh, especially with all the young new mu musicians nowadays. Oh. I wish I could yeah. invite them all to the yes. studio and say I, I pay for everything. Yeah. That was possible in the 80s and 90s yes. because we always sold 1,000 LPs. That's amazing. But uh, nowadays, you know, it's nothing no. comes back. So, yeah. um, so it's it's a new situation completely. But anyway, with my quartet, Hot Club de Norwege from the 70s and the festival in in Norway where we started to invite our heroes. Mm -hmm. We could invite uh, you know, Angelo de Bar. Jazz was not considered uh, hip enough yeah. because either you were uh, a modernist, you know, bebop and beyond, or you were a traditionalist. Mm. You know, the gypsy jazz is neither. Yeah. It's the whole thing and much more. <laughs> so uh, actually, we started playing in the streets, like Harvey uh -huh. just in the 70s, just to play every day. Yeah. And gradually, we had a radio hit <laughs> in '82 in Norway, so from then on we got indoors uh, gigs. <laughs> but with a quartet, and with a record company, and with a festival, I suddenly, since uh, you know, almost 40 years back, have been 100% engaged in Gypsy Jazz. But the funny thing is that in the mid-80s, the, the Django music revival, it had not reached Par gone out of Paris yet. No. And the, the French people in 88, when I was, uh, I had befriended uh, Motlo Faré mm -hmm. and some old, uh, marvelous musicians, and was allowed to re-release their old uh, jazz records. Uh, the French uh, people said, "But, uh, but what is this? <laughs> First, is a foreigner, <laughs> an étranger, who is uh, releasing our old records, and uh, and why release something old like?" This is not modern, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but at that time in Paris, they had the, the secret jewel of gypsy jazz, the, the Russian cabaret, you yeah. know, the gypsy cabaret yeah. in Paris. It was still a dozen of them. What so is a gypsy cabaret? What is that? It's, it was, used to be a place, it's, it doesn't exist anymore, uh -huh. but in the, uh, after the Russian Revolution, yeah. you know, uh, 50,000 uh, aristocrats mm -hmm. from uh, the Tsars, uh, yeah. Russia, had to escape. Mm -hmm. They escaped with gold and yeah. diamonds and their favorite entertainment, which uh -huh. was gypsies, Russian uh -huh. gypsy music. Really? They escaped to Paris and established a tradition of gypsy cabaret. Django played in the gypsy cabaret, uh -huh. um, or Russian cabaret, mm -hmm. when he was a oh, yeah. teenager. Banjo. He played banjo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Five fingers. Yes. And uh, it has continued until, until 15 years ago, then the last one. Now it's one, but it's mainly for the tourists. But still, in the 80s, the, the Russian cabaret was very much alive. Mm -hmm. So each night you can go from place to place, like 10, 15 places, and listen to three, four, five different gypsy acts. Mm -hmm. You know, all, they played 15 minutes in one place, and then moved to the next, play uh, half an hour. Yeah. So in that environment, you can hear incredible music, which was not a part of the commercial market. It was not a part of the mainstream music industry or environment, but it was a well-kept se secret in Paris. So Boom Ferry played there every night. You know, can you imagine? 
Yeah, I can imagine. So I went to Paris as soon as I had uh, <laughs> like uh, 300 uh, guilders. Yes. <laughs> I went to Paris and stayed uh, for some days just listening to what they did and it was incredible. So that, was, that is how I learned the music. But later, I mean, in the, when Angelo de Bar's uh, debut album came out in 19. 89, I think. Did you release that one? Or? Yes, yeah. I was a producer. Wow, man. <laughs> and um, that was the, in my view, that was the opening of the, the Gypsy Jazz in France. Mm -hmm. And it was a big success. And the, the same year when uh, I was contacted by Mime, uh, Stockler Rosenberg's father, mm -hmm. who had been very wise and let Stockler wait. Mm -hmm. Because at, when he was 13, he got uh, offers from the record companies, but Mimo said, no, I think we'll wait. Yeah. Very wise decision. Yeah. Saved his life. Yes. Saved, uh, it was perfect. Thank you, Mimo. <laughs> and then, but Mimo asked, uh, could you also produce uh, Stokolo? He's ready now. Super. So uh, I was uh, allowed to produce uh, Stokolo's first album, and we did a lot of work with it. With, Promotion and we in, got involved with Hans Mehlen, who was their manager to begin mm -hmm. with, and he uh, made contacts with a management, with a distribution company, with the press, etc. So I was at that time I was uh, I think I was in in um, in Amsterdam or in uh, Hilversum where we had the studio mm -hmm. uh, every two weeks for mm -hmm. one whole year just to promote uh, Seresta. And we succeeded. Mm -hmm. So what happened was that within one year, the the unknown gypsy jazz in the Netherlands, it was opened up to the mainstream uh, music uh, scene, and it, now it's a natural part of it. Debut album. Incredible. Yeah. So when that happened, you know the rest, of course. Uh, the Gypsy Jazz became a part of Dutch music. And the, the year after, the there Rosenberg was Sarasen. 50 kids wanting to do the same as Stockholm. Yeah. And there was Jimmy, and after that, we played with Jimmy for 12 years. You know, roller coaster high up and downs. Yeah. And, but uh, incredible music, fantastic music. So. It expanded from France. Uh, <laughs> the music was a part of it's a, it's a subculture in Paris, and then with the Angelo de Bar's record, the Gypsy Jazz was suddenly f completely French. But with Stockler Ros Rosenberg's record, it was also a part of the Netherlands. And in the beginning of the 1990s, uh, you could see also in other continents, not like that. Tokyo Hot Club Band in yeah. New Zealand, they had a yeah. Nairobi trio, a lot of uh, everywhere, yeah. except America. Uh -huh. so, because they didn't understand anything. Yeah. At that time, I was really busy in the record uh, production, and I said, Yeah, we have these incredible musicians. Andrew de Bar, Stockler Rosenberg, uh, Stefan Grappelli, Jimmy Rosenberg. You have to try it in uh, America. But why? It's and jazz is American, and why should we buy second type, uh, another type of jazz back to... No, makes no sense. Until the year 2000, uh -huh. when Pat and Ettore produced the first Jungle Festival mm -hmm. in... Who was it? Uh, Pat Phillips and Ettore Scola. They had for previously been the, the 
management for Stefan Grappelli. Oh, yeah. But when he, uh, when he was gone, they thought perhaps we should try what the rest of the world is now doing, having uh, Django festivals, so they tried. And it was a big success from the first, uh, first time. Mm -hmm. So now it's the, the biggest festival in the world. And you're holding this book here for yes. a good reason. This is something that I'm terribly interested in. <laughs> And yeah. I will show. Well, uh, it's called what is it called? The book called? It's called In Search of Stardust. And that you made it? Oh, yes. you wrote it. Okay. Oh yes, it's uh, it's brand new. It came out just a couple of months ago, okay. and it's the like a popular science presentation of my project. So, are you a scientist? Yes, I'm a researcher. A researcher in what field? In uh, astrophysics, astrophysics or mineralogy, but it's it's all about meteors. Yeah, Stones, yeah. rocks from space. Rocks from space. Exactly. Okay. And you, most people know about the met meteori meteorites, yeah. and which fall down occasionally, very rare, but mm -hmm. hand size, and they can tell us stories about the early stages of the solar system. Uh -huh, yeah. But what not so many people are aware about is that everywhere, here, in your every country, all over the globe, we are exposed exposed to a very gentle rain of very small mineral particles from space. We are exposed to a very gentle rain of mineral particles from space. That's right. It's like poetry. It is. is it? it is. Can you show me again, like what you did? You know, the, uh, it, where you find it. Let's go Deacon's outside. Deacon called it the the poetry of reality. Yeah. It is. I'll show you. Let's, let's go outside just yeah. for a second so you can show the, the world. Well, <laughs> well, world, first I want to well, show everybody. Actually, like of course, I, I play this guitar. Is, this is Piracicaba. Yes. And you see the typical Brazilian church in the distance. And here we see the roofs. And yes. yesterday... This could be everywhere, anywhere in the world. Yesterday John told me, he said, no, I'm not going to the concert because I think I prefer to go hunting for stardust on the roofs of Piracicaba. This is the second poem of the day. Hunting for stardust on the roofs of Piracicaba. Yes. And it is you know, John it, it, Larson it gives, who says stuff like yes, that. It, it gives <laughs> the, the roofs uh, another dim dimension, isn't absolutely, it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because what you see is roofs. They are meant to protect us from rain, from water. But what, at the same time, they on the roofs, uh, they accumulate uh, small mineral particles from space. And this is the important thing. It's these mineral particles are not just from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. They are from the outer solar system. Really? They are from the comet, from the Oort cloud, from the, so from the, the Kuiper, the Kuiper um, belt. Yeah. What, do you, what do you call it? What kind of belt? Uh, well, you see, the solar system was initially a cloud, mm -hmm. big cloud of dust, yeah. uh, coughed out from supernova explosions, mm -hmm. from previous generations of dying stars. Big stars, they, they, they expand and then collapse, and then they die at last by a big explosion, mm -hmm. and they blow out all the heavier particles. Mm -hmm. Then the helium and the hydrogen is all burned up, and has uh, become more heavy uh, elements. And uh, the last uh, they ever do is to, to blow these uh, small particles, this dust, out uh, in the interstellar space. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes clouds of dust uh, reached um, a threshold for a critical mass where they start to collapse. And uh, this happened with our own solar system uh, 4.56 uh, billion years ago. Mm -hmm. And this dust cloud imploded. It started to, uh, the small particles uh, gathered and became larger particles, which met and became larger and larger masses, small uh, planets, and then the small uh, planet weeds, uh, mm -hmm. protoplanets, they crashed into each other. And finally today we have a stage where there are uh, nine planets and the sun, plus outside of Pluto there is remnants of this cl dust cloud. 
This is where the comets come from. Mm -hmm. They have been found in the ice on the South Pole, uh -huh. where it's very, very, very clean. It's yeah. like a very dry desert. And when the micrometeorites are falling down on the snow, they gradually become a part of the ice. Mm -hmm. And then one million years later, we can melt the ice mm -hmm. and find the micrometeorites. That's why we know they exist. Very strange particles, the most exotic particles that are in the solar system. The oldest particles you can ever touch. Whatever you touch, uh, meteorites, every, everything is much younger. These are the oldest stuff in the universe. Like how old again? Say well, that. if it's a pre-solar grain, if it's a particle that comes from uh, as a supernova explosion uh -huh. before the formation of our solar system, it might be 8 billion years old. The twice of the age of our solar system. I can't so believe it. You, and you can touch it, you can feel this old thing. I'm so interested. And it's possible to find it everywhere. Wow. And your question, you asked, how is it possible to know that it's just a rock? Yeah. That's what I've spent seven years yes. investigating. So in the book I will present it. It's all different types. Oh, look at what, that. what you find when you start to look, this is from rolled dust. So I have been systematizing, this is from volcanoes, you know, different, this is from deserts, uh, glass particles from insulation, this is from Sahara, uh, this is from a meteorite uh, impact. Yeah. Uh, but how can you, if you... So I have to, you, you, first you, I had to you learn... Really, he like here in Peter Chicago, did you really go on a roof or what did you do? Well, I haven't done it yet, but I will. You will. I will. I want to film that. Yes, of course. So what I, I spent seven years on, this is just ordinary sand, what you find on every road and roof. Mm -hmm. and, but what are, how can I find the one micrometeorite among all these? Mm -hmm. So this is what I've done. Um, made a systematization of this and now I find it quite easy everywhere. I understand it. I can imagine. Yeah. So this is the book is presenting all the different types. It's this, incredible. Uh, fireworks, uh, glass, it looks reflex, like this was from from cold um, It's a mixture of candy and a jewelry box. It is. <laughs> it is indeed. Yeah. <laughs> this re reflex Sum paint summit from roads. Summit of everything that's attractive. <laughs> Every time you make, you take an um, angle cutter or a welding or you some kind of metal preparation, you produce the small sparks. Each of the sparks is one round globe like this. So it's just a systematization. So when, when I when I had what did you bring there in this bag, or did you? Bring well, this is how. I use this magnet because the micrometeorites ah, are magnetic. Yeah. So I use a magnet inside a plastic bag yeah. to avoid bringing uh, particles from from one roof to another. Yeah. Because I have a statistic on this. Yeah. And then I just put this in the, my whole hand in another bag. Yeah. And I do if this is the ground, mm -hmm. I do like this. <laughs> and then this, the magnetic particles will uh, attach to the yeah. magnet. And then, mm. yeah, ah, okay. I have to do it that way. I see. Yeah. Then I put the whole magnet into a third plastic bag. Yeah. And hold it and withdraw it, and then they fall down in the other bag. I repeat this enough times so I have the samples I need, and then I go home and uh, study it in the microscope after washing. Wash it, I wash it first to clean the surface because mm -hmm. I have to see the surface of each particle yeah. in order to recognize it. But the thing is, this nobody knew this. It was impossible. So this has been published uh, this summer mm -hmm. at a big conference in Berlin, a scientist, scientific conference. You need a Nobel Prize for... Well, it's, uh, I've got my own reward because I'm completely madly in love with these stones. So each time I find one, my heart beeps, beeps yeah. like, you know, I get really excited and happy. This is my reward. I totally understand that. So uh, it has just been published. Um, so what will happen next? I don't know. But I know for sure that I'm having a lot of lectures in, at universities uh, around the world. Um, I've also been invited to 
some schools to demonstrate the equipment, uh -huh. even to NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center in uh, really? in Texas. I'm going there on the roofs of NASA's. Really? <laughs> when is that going to happen? Uh, in the, uh, January, February, at that time. Okay. So because NASA have been, you know, they spent billions of dollars to find micrometeorites on comets and asteroids. They send um, um, space probes. Uh -huh. Rockets landing on a comet in order to find a dust probe, bring it back to Earth. It costs trillions of dollars. Uh -huh. And you just <laughs> I, I tell them, okay, but you can find exactly the same particles on the roof of the on the hangar where you have the, your equipment. So they, yes, you have to show us. So in January, I'm going there to have uh, to show them how to do to find it. So. Save uh, some trillions for NASA. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is really, really um, something I do because I enjoy it. Here in my plastic bag, I have the, <laughs> the travel equipment for search for stardust, uh -huh. which is quite simple. It's uh, in this little plastic bag. I have a magnet, strong magnet, uh, which I keep in my right hand because I'm right-handed. Yeah. In addition to the magnet, uh, I have just a metal spoon and a sieve. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the size of the stardust is the size that comes falls out from this sieve. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to prepare the, um, the sample, I sometimes just uh, pick up a lot of rubbish <laughs> like this and I take it through the sieve. So you see it's, it's very dirty and it's hands on. So now we are prepared to look for stardust. I can't wait. So I think it's the I've most poetic thing I've ever done with garbage on a roof. You know, that's that's the fun that it's uh, in this garbage, in this dirty place. We're looking for the most exotic and beautiful things in the I universe. Know, I know. <laughs> that the wind and rain are moving them around. So they don't lie uh, randomly on the, on the ground, on the ceiling, but they are blown into small accumulated places like this. So in this dirt, uh, mainly, this is mainly uh, dirt from you know, paint, from materials from the walls, etc. But in here, we most likely will find some stardust. So now I'm just preparing the magnet. So this is more or, more or less what the sample look like. These are the magnetic particles. These are not, of course, not all uh, extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. They are mainly terrestrial, but among the terrestrial particles, there might be uh, some stardust. So now I'm emptying it down here, so it's, it's very little yet, mm -hmm. but we'll repeat it and get some, some more. And then there are three other <laughs> lanterns like this. So, was one mm -hmm. and just to to have the the maximum chances to find something I will do the same procedure uh, with the three others and uh, three, three other what a lantern there in one minute oh the lanterns corner. ah yes. there's because the wind, wind will always blow the small particles ah. and gather the hair it's not possible for the wind to blow it away yeah so as soon as you entered the roof you already looked around and saw yes. the corners where it will probably gather exactly and if the walls hadn't been there, everything would have been just blown, blown away. down to the streets. Yeah, so we're lucky. Where there are so much more 
uh, of magnetic particles because of all the construction work Absolutely, yeah. in cities. But that has been my work for seven years now to, to map all the man-made uh, particles from construction work, etc. So, so that's why I'm hunting on roofs. Take it all with me and clean it when I get home. Will you clean it with water? Uh, water, lots of water and dishwasher oh, powder. Yeah. Okay, so that doesn't hurt. Uh... No. So we are nearly finished.
again. This is this is more or less an average sample. Um, when I get home, I have a uh, oh yeah a list of all every single sample I've taken. So this is approximately one th number one thousand. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's absolutely no guarantee that we have found real stardust. Of course. But there's a fair chance, really. Okay. So it could be two, zero, two, or, <coughs> or perhaps up to five, <laughs> five fantastic particles from uh, outer space. This is what I do, and I love it. <laughs> Until this summer, mm -hmm. it had not been published scientifically, uh -huh. so it was... Uh, not even controversial, it was not possible. Yeah. That was what the, the other people in NASA say, it, you know, this is, go ahead, knock yourself out, but this is not possible. And now? And now they say, oh, come to the Johnson Space Center and show us how you do it. Yes. So I will go there in January, February, yes. to, uh, to do the same as we have done now okay. on the roofs of Johnson Space Center. <laughs> <laughs> and Irene, you are the first one in the world to document this. <laughs> Tell me, like, what can we learn from these particles, possibly? What do you think we can learn if from them? If we find something here, it's uh, remnants from the earliest stages of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And we can, uh, if we get access to more of these uh, stardust particles, we can learn a lot more about how the solar system was formed, mm -hmm. uh, in what order, perhaps, you know, some of the Micrometeorites uh, contain a lot of uh, organic carbon um, uh, matter, uh -huh. so we don't really know where life came from. And has uh, the micrometeorites or the meteorites had uh, anything to contribute to the evolving of life on mm -hmm. Earth? We don't know, but I think so. But you think the meteorites contributed to the to yes. the formation of life on yes. Earth. Yes, the carbon meteorites, uh -huh. uh, which these are a part of, uh, contain a lot of complex organic uh, molecules, uh -huh. um, like uh, amino acids, uh -huh. So, which yes. is, if you have four of them, uh, you can build a DNA sequence. Wow, that is so interesting. Mm. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, or tell us a bit more? Well, the As of today, we don't know about anywhere else in the universe where there's life. Mm -hmm. It's only on Earth. Yeah. I think there are life everywhere, but uh, we don't know. Yeah. And what we know is that life started somehow on Earth with a lot of organic uh, complex molecules. Uh, also, we know that the meteorites contribute, they contain very complex organic molecules. Organic means uh, carbon um, molecules. They are not biogenic, of course, they are uh, mineralic, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, they might have contributed with important uh, building bricks, building stones of the formation of the evolvement of mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. itself. Because How do you define life? What do you mean by life? Well, it's auto-reproduction. So auto-reproduction is life. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I'm just listening. Mm -hmm. oh. So, but, but how, <laughs> how from the mineral kingdom, stardust, you can suddenly become John Larson. Become <laughs> us. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> and the mystery is all in this bag. Well, it, it might, the question was, what can we learn from this? Yes. This is one of the things we perhaps can find something, yeah. a small bit of the puzzle, yeah. to finally solve this mystery. Yeah. Hmm. And how many of those particles, how much of that do you need, you think, to do enough research? Or to do oh, what? It's never need. enough, but I mean... Never enough. No. So the more, the merrier. Yeah. Until now, this, these particles have only been found you know, in the ice on the South Pole, mm -hmm. in very limited quantities, mm -hmm. very few particles. The total mass of all micrometeorites on Earth is like a quarter of a teaspoon. Yeah. But now that we know it is possible to find them on roofs in cities, we don't have to pay for expensive expeditions to go to the Antarctica to, uh, to, to, <laughs> to search for 10 more micrometers. We can do it here. Yeah. So this might open up a new window into knowledge about the solar system.
Also, you said it is you keep you document where you found the particles. Yes. Be because it's important, like it's this roof in Piracicaba where we are now. Yes. And why is that important? What is the difference? Well, to begin with, I didn't know what to search for because yeah. I didn't know wh what they looked like. So I kept very strict. Um, uh, protocol yes. for cleaning of the equipment each time I moved to a different place because I I did not only search on roofs I've searched in wild nature on beaches in deserts in mountains woods on, in soil beach mm -hmm. sand every everywhere coral islands mm -hmm. just in order to find these particles and um, so I started with a strict um, catalog mm -hmm. where I have each field search has a number and I make notes about what I find everywhere and uh, with time I was able to recognize the most common types of particles so in the end by pure elimination I could uh, find the micrometeorites. That took me seven years. But I mean uh, maybe I did not listen well enough but is there is it imp why is it important to know if you found it in Piracicaba or in Norway or ah, in Amsterdam or no, wherever? That's not, I not important anymore by this stage because ah. now we know they are everywhere and... Uh, but maybe you can learn something if you keep documenting that you never yes, know what you Yes, of course, you, you never find. know what yeah. you can read out of it uh, yeah. in retrospect, yeah. of course. But, uh, but another thing is that this would be the first urban micrometeorites from Brazil. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so that's... One small uh, yes. <laughs> sentimental reason for, <laughs> for keeping track of all these particles. <laughs> the title of this movie is Stardust for David.
Plato once said, he said, uh, if you play a wrong note, that doesn't matter. But if you play without passion, that's unforgivable.